Well, I'm just very grateful for everyone who serves us in music, in the music ministry. Um, not only this morning, but week in and week out. Thank you guys so much for serving us by taking us to the throne room of grace and where we can worship the Lord for his incredible mercy. And we're going to continue worshiping this morning as we open up our Bibles. And we're going to worship from Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. This is a short text, and I'm still afraid that I don't have enough time. Let's read verse 10 together. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning very aware that true worship, to truly worship you means to be consumed with pleasing you. We want our lives, we want our hearts, We want the meditation of our minds. We want the words of our lips. We want them to put a smile on your face. We long to live in a way that would please you and honor you. We long to live free of fear of man. We long to demonstrate the power of the gospel in a life that would be so consecrated to you that we would be unconcerned and unfettered from the applause of men. And Lord, we know that fear of man is a constant temptation, and it's a constant threat, and we know that it has countless implications. It would live a lie against you. It would tell a watching, lost, hopeless world that the gospel of Christ is not worthy of It's not powerful to save from the fear of man. It's not worth living for you. All of these lies would be tragic. And we would hate to think the thought that we would ever live a lie. So Lord, we pray that our lives would be filled and consumed with pleasing you. We pray that your priorities would be our priorities. We pray that your loves would be our loves. And we pray that what you hate would be something that we would always hate. And we pray that these passions and desires would only increase and that they would be held in biblical balance. And we pray, Lord, that if only we could just live. You've given us one life. If we could just live one life. Worshiping only you with you our only audience, with you being the only, the only one that we are concerned to please, striving with all that we are to put a smile on your face. And Lord, this would be the greatest privilege of our existence, to be your slave. And so I pray that you would teach us Teach us how to do that this morning. We pray that you would protect us from waywardness, that you would keep us on the straight and narrow. Teach us what it means to be intolerant of error so that we would simply fear you. In your name we pray. Amen. Our culture esteems one virtue above all, tolerance. It would seem that uh, the toleration of anyone and anything is required for a civilized society. Our culture tolerates various forms of sexual aberrancy, human autonomy, the right of every individual to define themselves, the right to be our own authority, to determine our own purpose, to define what satisfies us and what pleases me. Uh, this is the foundational principle of our culture's tolerance. And we don't just tolerate, but we promote the right 
of each and every individual to experience no hostility, let alone confrontation, let alone mere disagreement. This toleration is built on the principle that everyone has the right to live in a world where no one else can disagree. And anyone who disagrees with me ought not to be tolerated, ironically. (laughs) The irony of tolerance is intolerance could not be more pronounced. We live in a day and age where tolerance is the greatest virtue and the only thing not to be tolerated are those who don't tolerate. And so those who promote intolerance inevitably violate their prime principle whenever they don't tolerate people who are intolerant. The impossibility of tolerance as a principle uh, can be shown in a story that I recently read. and This is an account written by D.A. Carson in his book, The Intolerance of Tolerance. And he writes as follows. In 2006, according to the BBC, a 75-year-old man, Edward Atkinson, living in Kings Lynn, Norwich, was waiting for a hip replacement at Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Because he is against abortion, he began mailing the hospital pictures of aborted babies. The chief executive of the hospital, Ruth May, viewed this as a case of abuse or unacceptable behavior toward hospital staff and canceled the operation. Moreover, the Swatham Magistrate's Court sentenced the crippled 75-year-old man to 28 days in jail for sending offensive literature to the hospital staff. Apparently, aborting a baby is legal, and one must be tolerant of abortionists. Depicting abortion, however, is a crime, and those who distribute such depictions and oppose abortion must be jailed and refused needed health care that would be provided to murderers and rapists. So here again is government-backed intolerance in the name of a new tolerance. Intolerance and tolerance is I've never been more confused, and it's very important when we think about tolerance and intolerance that we think about it from a biblical standpoint, because what's being promoted today, uh, tolerance, is confusing if you read the Bible and you realize that the Bible actually puts a high value on tolerance. What you must realize is that they are not the same thing. Secularly defined, tolerance itself has even gone under should have gone through changes. It used to be that tolerance in another day, in another era, tolerance would be accepting the right of others to agree or disagree. You accept that they have a right to their own view. That would have been the secular definition of tolerance probably 100 years ago. Today, we have a new definition of tolerance, and that means that you need to accept other people's views, every other view, as correct, which is impossible. As we already have seen, tolerance as a virtue uh, which accepts the rightness of every other view uh, can't exist because it has to reject everything that says no, there actually is a right and a wrong. And so we need to remind ourselves that the, when the Bible talks about tolerance, it doesn't talk about the acceptance of error. Nothing could be more unloving than the acceptance of error as true or right. To come up with a very simple illustration, uh, if we were talking about the realm of parenting, every parent knows that it's not loving to endorse every errant thought and desire of their child. Every desire to go play baseball on on the freeway. (laughs) The desire of a child to test out that metal knife in in the electrical socket. There's a lot of desires that are just not loving to tolerate. And the same is true spiritually. And Scripture never puts a premium on tolerating error. It condemns it outright. When the Scriptures talk about toleration, what is tolerated are people, not error. People, not error. Ephesians 4 says, tolerate one another, not error. And so the culture is attempting to tolerate anyone and everything, but the scripture says otherwise. We would be criminal if we tolerated error, and we would not be, as we're going to see in verse 10, we would not be a slave of Christ if we tolerated error. 
But before we look at this verse, let me make a few comments here, a few caveats. Verse 10 is properly a verse about the fear of man versus the fear of God. If you notice in 10a and 10b, it makes a parallel between seeking God's favor versus man's favor or striving to please men, and then trying to please men would actually preclude you from being a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So slaves of Christ seek to please him, not man. That's pretty obvious from the verse. However, we're also going to see that this verse is doing something. It's carrying some weight. It's accomplishing something incredibly important in this paragraph. Namely, it's explaining what Paul has previously said in the paragraph about refusing to tolerate error. It explains why Paul does not tolerate error. And so as we look at this, I want to just explain, first of all, that patient silence about ever error in every context does not mean that you're a man pleaser. So before we dive into this passage, you might be thinking, man, wait a minute. If, if verse 10 is saying that you can only fear God or fear man, it's, just one, it's a black and white categorical option. And if verse 10 is also saying that if you fear man, you're not a slave of Christ. And if verse 10 is actually saying this is the only way to be faithful with the gospel so that we don't tolerate error, then am I a compromiser if I heard somebody at dinner air out some errant opinion and I didn't just shut it down and open up my Bible and just refute it right then and there? No. No, that's not, that's not necessarily the case. If you compromised on truth because you were concerned about what that person thought of you, that was sin. But if you use self-control to say, Nah, that's, not the right, that's not the right time. This is not the right location. We, we can put that on the back burner. We'll talk about that later. But out of love, you said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on something more important. I'm going to serve this person's need, and that's not the greatest need right now. That's wise. That's wise. I also just want to say, before we work through this passage, you, you should not be confused when Paul is here highlighting the exclusive nature of what it means to please God as opposed to pleasing man when a couple weeks ago, Smed showed us from Romans 15 that Paul also says that you're never more Christ-like than when you strive to please your neighbor. That could sound kind of confusing because Romans 15 says, don't look out to your own interests. You're actually never more like Christ than when you Die to your own wish and die to your own desires and you actually serve someone else for the interests of others. Serve one another. And then Paul turns around right here and says, if I was consumed with pleasing man, I wouldn't be a bondservant of Christ. The difference? The difference is Romans 15 is talking about preferences and dying to self with personal preferences in order to serve people, whereas Galatians 1 is talking about the message being contaminated, the message being watered down, or the message being changed because of a concern about what the audience would think of you. That's the difference. And I would also like to just reiterate that there is a massive difference between being intolerant of error in Galatians 1 and being tolerant of people. As we work through this verse and a little bit of the context in Galatians 1, it's also interesting to keep in your minds that there's another context where Paul says something that sounds almost opposite. He here is dealing with false teachers who have contaminated the gospel because of fear of man. Their gospel has changed because they're concerned about what people think of them, and he absolutely condemns them. But in Philippians chapter 1, Paul deals with preachers who are preaching Christ, but they're preaching Christ out of false motives, and they have ungodly motives. Their desires are not correct. In fact, in Philippians 1, Paul's in jail, these other preachers are free, and they're going about preaching the gospel, and he says, I rejoice that they're preaching the gospel. I rejoice they're preaching Christ. That thrills me because the gospel's going forward, but I know that they're doing it to stir me up. It seems as though, whatever, however that played out, he doesn't quote them, but it seems as though those, false, those teachers who had the false motives were actually preaching the true gospel, or else Paul wouldn't have praised them and he wouldn't have rejoiced at the message going forth. The issue there was the gospel was not contaminated, the message was intact, 
But the message was laced with bitter, derisive comments against Paul and his authority. I can imagine those guys were saying something like, well, oh, you heard from Paul? Well, yeah, you know, obviously he did something wrong because we're preaching the same message and uh, he's in jail and we're not. So anyway, here's the message. And they got the message right and they're throwing Paul under the bus. And Paul's utterly unconcerned about his own personal reputation. He's just thrilled they got the message right. And so there's a huge difference between tolerating error and tolerating people. But let's dive right in. Chapter 10, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 10. Am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? The Greek word here is pytho. It's a word that means to persuade. It can mean in context even to obey. And so here the idea is if you're seeking to persuade someone in the sense of you're seeking their approval, you're trying to win them over. That might be a great way to paraphrase this phrase. Am I trying to win over men or God? Paul's describing his ministry this way. He's describing his his labors before the Galatians. Preaching, writing this letter, the ebb and flow of his life. He's asking the question, what would you say? Is my life trying to win over and win the approval of men or am I trying to win the approval of God? In the second question, he simply rewords it. Am I striving to please men? And the question here is, who are you trying to please? Who are you trying to impress? These two questions were so helpful for me as I thought about preaching this morning. This week I was looking at this passage and thinking about this sermon and walking in front of an audience of one. John, who are you trying to impress? Who are you trying to win over? Paul could look at his ministry and say, I think it's evident. My ministry is governed by the consuming focus. I am desperate that God would have a smile on his face because of me. That's it. When Paul asks that question, am I now seeking the favor of men? Am I trying to win over men? Or am I trying to win over God? Or am I striving to please men? He's he's asking the question, is it enough for me to be pleasing to God and no one else? Bank on it, Christians. (laughs) If you are pleasing to God, you will not be pleasing to most. And there are certain seasons where God will graciously give you a taste of what might seem like being pleasing to God in this context means not pleasing my neighbor and not pleasing my unsaved family and not pleasing my biological family and at times even not pleasing fellow Christians. Is it enough in that moment to simply and only be pleasing to God, we have to be governed by a fear of God. In verse 10b, he gives us a conditional statement. And um, grammarians would call this a second-class condition, which doesn't really mean much, but what that actually means is what Paul does here is he kind of argues against the fact. It's like, let me, let me make a condition, and let me just, this is not true, but let's just suppose this were true for the sake of argument for a second. That's what he's doing here in 10b. And he says it this way, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And so he just says it that way. For the sake of argument, let's just say, I were trying to please men. If that were the case, I would not even be Christ's slave. That's a helpful statement. You cannot be a slave of Christ and a man pleaser. You cannot please God and man at the same time. You cannot please man and be Christ's slave. You can't belong to him in the ultimate sense that your will has been conformed to his will. Again, when Paul says the word slave, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, we shouldn't equate that to just 
our concept or notion of employee and employer. There's a lot of similarities. Um, There's much more similarities between our version of employee and employer and slave and master in Paul's day than the American slave trade. And so, but then still, it's not one for one. The difference between our uh, familiar concept of uh, the workforce and a master, or I mean, sorry, an employer and an employee, the difference between that and a slave and a master in Paul's day is the issue of exclusive right to one's labor and will. We can have multiple part-time jobs, but a slave in the Greco-Roman era would have had one master who had the exclusive right to all of his energies, and that's why he provided everything he needed for living. But there's no such thing as a part-time slave with three masters, whereas you can have a part-time employee with three employers. That's, that's, that's where the breakdown happens. And that's actually very important to understand this verse. Let me read to you a little section from an article um, from a, a dictionary on this word explaining the significance of this word for a slave. In the slavery word group, we have a service which is not a matter of choice for the one who renders it, which he has to perform whether he, um, um, whether he believes it or not. Because... Um, He is a subject as a slave to an alien will, the will of his owner. That's important. A slave is subject to an alien will. So his master has desires for him, and his own desires don't matter at all. The distinctive feature of the self-awareness of the Greek is the thought of freedom, The Greek finds his personal dignity in the fact that he's free. Thus, his self-awareness stands out sharply from anything which stands under the concept of uh, this verb to be a slave. For where there is slavery, um, uh, there is human autonomy is set aside and an alien will takes precedence over one's own. The slave not only has no possibility of evading the tasks laid upon him, but he also has no right of personal choice. He must rather do what another will have done, and refrain from doing what another will not have done. That's why it's so critical to understand that when Christ became man, he took on the form of a slave. He didn't just act like a slave for a 33-year period. He actually became a slave by submitting his will to his father, what else would it mean for Christ to say in Gethsemane, not your will be done, but mine? Christ perfectly subjected his human will to the will of his father, even, even against his strong desire to even avoid association with sin so righteous was his human will. That when his father said, you're going to take sin and I'm going to place it on your shoulders and you are now going to be treated as sinner, his righteous will so hated and loathed the thought of being associated with our sin, he didn't want to do that. But he subjected his will to his father's. There's no better picture of a slave than Christ in Gethsemane. Not your will be done, but mine. And so Paul, in verse 10, he can say, if I were still trying to please men, then categorically, by definition, I wouldn't be a slave of Christ. To be a slave of Christ means you place your own will Aside, you reject it, you submit it to Christ's will because you're his slave, and you're consumed with accomplishing Christ's will, and you're focused on pleasing Christ, on putting a smile on his face. Now, you might look at this verse and you might think, okay, I'm understanding what you're saying about Seeking to please God. That's right there in the first half of the verse. And it makes sense then in the second half of the verse, Paul's making the point, if you're trying to please men, you can't be a slave of Christ. If you are a slave of Christ, then you're just exclusively trying to please Christ. That makes sense. But what are you talking about, John? This, this, what, how does this relate to toleration of error? 
It's interesting, you know, I, I, I did some reading on tolerance and intolerance, and it's just fascinating to me that uh, you can read a lot of Christian literature on tolerance versus intolerance, and it seems like it's, most of it is governed and, and geared toward the, the culture, the secular culture and the secular society. And I don't think we should be surprised that the secular culture and the secular society makes a virtue out of tolerance and they are intolerant of the gospel and they're intolerant of truth and they're intolerant of everything that would offend their, their unbelief and uh, sting their conscience. That makes perfect sense to me. What I read in Galatians 1 is infinitely more penetrating and more helpful for us in the church than anything I read this week. Because for Paul, Paul is... Paul, Paul, I don't even know a place in the canon where Paul like, expresses shock at the unbelieving culture being tolerant of error. But in Galatians 1, we read Paul being shocked at the church's toleration of error. So what's happening is the world's logic is bleeding into the church. Here's the world's logic. Premise 1, truth is relative. There is more than one way to get to heaven, and whichever way works for you is just fine. Premise two, Christianity says that, Christ, that God is the only, there's only one God, and the only way to God is through faith in Jesus Christ. So conclusion, the therefore, of this logical syllogism is Christianity is wrong. Ironically, their conclusion contradicts premise one, that truth is relative. <laughs> They're asserting an objective absolute truth when they say that Christianity is wrong, um, while starting with the conviction that truth is relative. And that's been exposed a thousand times by virtually every Christian author who's ever written a critique on the unbelieving culture. And that's not the problem. That's not a solution. The unbelieving culture is not sitting there saying, I'm just really committed to this whole abortion thing, and then, oh, wow, you pointed out this, yeah, we threw him in jail. Oh, I, I see the illogical nature of my position. Now I repent in dust and ashes. It's never happened. It's never happened. Of course, that's what the world does, because all unbelief is irrational. What's shocking is when the church takes the same logic, and when the church starts to capitulate, and when the church won't stand for truth. There's an incredible context here, and we've got to be quick because I'm quickly running out of time, and I've got to finish up my second point here, but I actually want to preach a mini-sermon on verses 1 to 9, and we need to for this simple reason, that I, want, I was committed to the thrust of verse 10, but you, you, you're going to miss out on the, the punch of verse 10 because the conjunction 4 connects it to the context, and this whole topic of man-fearing is doing something besides simply asking us, do you fear God or man? This verse is actually asking the, answering the question, why does the church capitulate? Why does the church ever tolerate error? Answer, because in degrees, the church begins to fear man. Christian, if you're concerned about faithfulness, and you better be. If you are concerned about faithfulness to the truth, if you're concerned about faithfulness to the gospel, if you're concerned about perseverance, then mark my words, if 20 years from now you are not persevering in the truth, it's because of fear of man. If you are, con are content to please God only and to be a minority, or if at times an island to yourself, you will not tolerate error and you will persevere. So let's look at this context, because this word for at the beginning of verse 10 is doing an awful lot. And so let's do it really quick, perhaps nothing more than a run, running commentary on verses 1 through 10. Paul starts this letter by saying, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God, the Father who raised him from the dead. Now that's a phrase that's so common, I could probably point to 10 to 12 equivalent statements in the New Testament. And as I was studying this week, I was struck once again. In fact, I was reading one commentary that talked about being called as an apostle by God, not by man, for about five pages. And I mean, I skimmed through the first page, I'm like, all right already, we know it. And they're like, let's just get on. And then I ran through the second page, and I was just, okay, yeah, he's still saying, in the third page, and then the fourth page, and then the fifth page, and I was thinking, called by God. 
Paul is doing what he's doing simply because God Almighty told him to do so. This is not a job. This is not a task he committed to. This wasn't a New Year's resolution. This is a divine calling. God called him to be an apostle. He gave him a message. This is divine origin, divine source. That changes everything, doesn't it? If you think about our calling as Christians, and, you know, callings might be different. I mean, if I'm, I'm called to be, a, to be a preacher, and I think about what it means to preach, it's like, uh, it's not just far from some job. God Almighty saved me. He shouldn't have. Just by his sheer justice, his sheer righteousness. But because of his grace and his mercy, he saved me and sent me to go preach. Woe is me if I don't do that. I started thinking about for Paul, the extra, the extra beyond anything that you or I experience would be the fact that he was called to be an apostle. And he's delivering a message that was revealed to him. He's going to have to stop fearing God to deviate from the message that God revealed to him. Paul, an apostle, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches in Galatia, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this is a very common Pauline phrase, common to all 13 of his epistles. Grace is God's free, unmerited favor. It's the gift that he gives to his creation, common by virtue of his loving kindness on his enemies, special in the form of Christ on the cross, dying so that enemies might be made his children and have a peaceable, reconciled relationship. And that's what produces the peace. Peace is the fruit of the grace. Peace is not an inner sense of stability. It's not a sense of happiness. It is a state of no longer being at odds with God, being reconciled to God, being on good terms with a God formerly offended. Grace and peace to you, Galatians. Grace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'll never forget, I I do believe it was the first time I studied Galatians 1-4 as a Christian. And I remember staggering at that phrase, he gave himself for our sins. I had grew up in the church. I knew the gospel. I'd shared the gospel as an unbeliever, as some exercise for youth ministries. I had told people Jesus died for sin. Rose three days later. But I'll never forget the experience of reading this for the first time, knowing for the first time that it was for my sins. He gave himself up for my sins. That's condescension that went too far. (laughs) And I remember my immature Christianity rebuking God for going too far. And then repenting of my rebuke. But at the same time, feeling like he went too far. Why in the world did Christ give himself up for my sins? And this verse means something entirely different than Paul intended if you just simply take out that personal preposition, our. And to appreciate where Paul goes in the next five verses from verse 6 to 10, I just want to pause and ask you, ask you right now. Do you know that those are yours? Did Christ give himself up for your sins? So Paul is reminding them of these truths. He's taught them these truths in his ministry to them. And now he's writing. And what's unique about verse 6 He ends the benediction, the greeting, and what's typical for Paul at this point is to launch into a prayer, to explain, hey, by the way, I'm encouraged by this and this and this, let me just tell you how I'm praying for you, and that's how every Pauline letter has a prayer right here, except Galatians. Not that he doesn't pray for them, but he just gets after it, and it's like the gloves come off from the very beginning of the body. Look at verse 6. I'm amazed. I am shocked. I am startled 
that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. He's looking at the Galatians, and he's realizing they are entertaining false gospels. They're entertaining another gospel. And in fact, when he says a different gospel in verse 6, he uses the word that means a different of um, a, 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 another. It means, just simply means another of a different kind. And then in verse 7, he uses a word that means another of the same kind. They're not the same word in, in English. It's translated very well in the NAS. They switch from a different to another. The idea is, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for another gospel of a different kind, which is really not another gospel of the same kind. In other words, he's saying is, you haven't just gone after some other emphasis or somebody's different articulation of it. Yeah, it's the same gospel. One's preached by Paul, one's preached by Peter. No, it's not that. This is a different gospel, which is not any gospel. It's not good news because it's another gospel. It's different by way of content. It's different by way of message. It's different by way of mechanism about how you would actually be restored to a God formerly offended. It's not another gospel. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Chapter 2 explains that men have come into the church. In the chapter 2 example, it's actually men sent from James whether they just claim to be from James or whether James even was compromising at this point, we don't know. Certainly Peter was compromising because it says so in chapter 2. But men are creeping into the church who are distorting the gospel of Christ, perverting it, twisting it, keeping much the same, but just tampering with a few critical errors here and there. So verse 8, Paul says, But even if we were an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As, I've, as we've said before, so I'm going to say it again. If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. Sometimes we might read a verse like this and we might just be lulled into sleep by the familiarity. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's okay. Well, I guess it's strong, it's got an exclamation point. Don't miss it. Don't miss it, believers. When the gospel gets perverted, those who preach it, well, those who listen to it are condemned. And those who preach it are accursed, damned, objects of God's special wrath. He even goes so far to say, even an angel from heaven and then he even goes to say, so far to say, even if we, even if we preach a different gospel. I told my boys, I've asked them, is that a believer? And every time so far they've said, yeah, fortunately. And I've said, but what if 20 years from now I wasn't living for Christ? First time I asked him, stunned looks. What would that mean? He said, mark my words, boys. 20 years from now, dad's not living for Christ. Dad's a liar. Not the word. If the message gets changed, if I change something other than what you've read in the Bible and what you've heard me articulate from the scriptures, I should be condemned. And I will be. It's just, there's no other way to put it. It's one of those understatements in the Bible. You can't overstate this. Paul is shocked that they're turning aside. They're tolerating it. They're tolerating changes to the gospel. They're tolerating little differences, and they're tolerating emendations and edits, additions and subtractions. Why are they tolerating it? Well, verse 10 explains Paul's shock. He explains, look, I told you I'm shocked. Verse 10 is the basis for why he's so shocked and why, how he's staying faithful. Because I'm a slave of Christ. I'm not trying to please people. Guess what? These guys 
are trying to please people. What's this look like? What's this look like? Look, for the unbeliever, it's obvious. There's unbelievers in the church, and an unbeliever is enslaved to the fear of man. And the fact that you are enslaved to the fear of man, if you're an unbeliever, will prevent you from ever believing. If you're enslaved to the fear of man, you cannot help yourself. Your only hope is to turn to Christ to deliver you from the fear of man. Because categorically, fear of man prevents belief. Look at John chapter 5 for a moment. We're going to do a quick cross-reference. Let me show you what, what Jesus said and remind you of this statement. John chapter 5, verses 41 to 44. John chapter 5, verse 41. Jesus says it absolutely, categorical, very simply. Jesus said, I do not receive glory from men. He doesn't receive glory from men. He's not looking for uh, affirmation from men. He looks exclusively for his affirmation from his Father. Verse 42. But I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. Notice, fear of God equals love of God. Being consumed with pleasing God is love of God. In verse 42. Verse 43. I've come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How fascinating is that? A speaker gets up, has a religious message, talks about Christ, even opens up a Bible, quotes some verses, but the motive of his message is self glory, personal significance. Well, who listens to that guy? Everyone who wants self-significance. It's an immediately attractive message. It resonates with everyone in the audience who is also wanting self-significance. But verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Notice An unbeliever is not seeking glory from God. They're seeking glory from men. So how could you possibly believe? How could you possibly embrace a message that it gives exclusive glory to God when you're seeking your own glory? You're looking around at people, sizing them up. What do they think of me? Here's some fodder for self-significance. Here's some more attaboys. Here's some pats on the back. Audience to be impressed by me. How could you possibly believe in that frame of mind? You can't believe the gospel if that's your frame of mind. That's an unbeliever. What's that look like in the life of a believer? Go back to Galatians, and I'm going to fast forward to chapter 2. Chapter 2 gives us the perfect example. We obviously, we know it's a believer, because Paul names him. Chapter 2, verse 11. When Cephas, that's Peter, Simon Peter, the apostle, the leader of the church, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. So Peter has not been faithful to the gospel. He has compromised, fortunately for a short season, and he responds positively to Paul's correction because, of course, he loves the Lord, and he hears the truth, and he sees the error of his ways, and so he repents. But the question then would be, why did Peter compromise? Why did Paul have to confront him? Well, on the surface of it, It was because he started capitulating and his gospel changed into a gospel that was very Jewish. He started thinking about his Judaism. There were people who came in. Verse 12 says, For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. I can just imagine what these guys would say. Hey, Peter, listen. I mean, you know, you do know, like, we are the Jews, right? Like, we've had the promises. We've had revelation for millennia before the Gentiles, right? And, like, we're not saying that Jesus is wrong or that you need, of course you need Christ and a crucified Savior and and righteousness. Yeah, but you do understand, don't you, Peter, that you actually, even as a justified sinner, you would actually put a bigger smile on God's face if you actually obeyed those laws and those commands that actually distinguish us as the Jewish people? Because he actually, those are from God. And you can see the plausibility of that one. That's actually way more plausible than the ones we face because they're appealing to the Old Testament, just an abuse of the Old Testament. And so these men come from James. What's happening in Peter's heart? It's not a, it's not a clinical evaluation. It's not as though Peter... It's grading papers, and he says, oh, here's the gospel that I preached last week, and here's one from these guys. 
Let me evaluate, do a clinical analysis. No. What happens? Paul tells us in 12, end of verse 12, fearing the party of the circumcision. You see that? Man-fearing. Man-fearing caused Paul's, uh, sorry, Peter's compromise. These guys come in with another message, and he's thinking, well, what are they going to think of me? And these guys are heavy hitters, and I mean, I, I, I mean, that's, I, mean I, I, I want to be thought well of, and I mean, do I really need to refute that right now? And, and then it just starts to lead one compromise to another because there is in his heart man-pleasing. The rest of the Jews, verse 13, joined him in his hypocrisy. So now his compromise is having horizontal, catastrophic horizontal effects with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? And then of course we know that Peter repented and and, and was restored, but the point being that Paul and Peter both know the message that they had was of divine origin. The difference is Peter compromised because he feared man. Go back to verse 8 and 9. Paul is so committed to the divine origin of his message, he's so committed to his own authority because it's not from him that he can say, if I change, then don't believe me anymore. This is an authority that comes from outside of yourself, and to maintain it, you have to fear God, not man. I had a, appreciated the illustration of Lloyd-Jones, I mean, not the illustration that he gave, but he was the illustration of this very principle. I remember watching an interview between him and a news anchor woman in 1970. If you, if you want, you can, you can watch it on, on YouTube. It's, it's totally, and this, is the, this is the only reason why YouTube even exists, is for this kind of interview. It's recorded in 1970, and this news anchor woman, um, you know, she's, she's a British noble, and she's interviewing him, and, and she's just like in shock and awe as she interviews Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the famous preacher from London. And Lloyd-Jones starts to go down a line of reasoning that she finds completely reprehensible and completely intolerant. And as she interviews him, you get, she has this look on her face like, I'm trying to be civil, but you are just a strange little man. And it's just this very condescending look on her face. And here's, here's, the, uh, here's the, the conversation. Basically, you kind of get the sense that she's asking you, like, what you're telling me, isn't this totally intolerant? Aren't you just completely arrogant? Like, this doesn't sound like what I thought Christians would say. So she says to him, this point of view is obviously held with great conviction by you, but I would have thought it brought you that I would have thought it brought you into conflict with people who not only don't subscribe to the Christian religion, but to many other Christians as well. And Lloyd Jones says to that, Well, of course it does. I'm sorry about this. This is something I deeply regret. But this is this isn't the first time, you know, that minorities have been right. In any case, we don't decide this kind of question by counting heads. I know nothing about these things, primarily, apart from what I find in the Bible. Again, it's, it's the 1970s, and it's already the idea, like, she's thinking this has got to be some sort of subjective thing with Lloyd-Jones. It's something that you're coming up with. And he's like, oh, I'm just declaring to you what came from outside of me, handed to us by God in his revelation. But I maintain that the story of the human race and the story of salvation is a proof of the truth of the Bible. And she jumps in and she says, well, what I would suggest is that whereas they would tolerate your point of view as a different and divergent view of Christianity, you are quite unprepared to tolerate their view as a possible version of the truth. Is that correct? I am. <laughs> of course I am. And this I say, of course, quite deliberately. I say that for this reason, that Christianity is a very exclusive and dogmatic faith. Take for the Apostle Paul, for instance, writing, he says, Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel other than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. He puts it like that. And you mention, that's the arrogance of Paul. I say, no. This man has been given his message. He received it by revelation. It isn't his point of view. If a man asserts his own point of view as the result of his own thinking in this intolerant manner, well, he is a bore, and he is not to be tolerated. He's a hopeless fellow. But when you are given truth, which you claim is truth from God, well, then you have no right to be anything but intolerant. When I find people insinuating their own theories and ideas and using the name of Christ, I have to protest. This is is dishonest, apart from anything else, in my opinion. And then she says, 
But nonetheless, it's a highly regarded Christian virtue these days to be both charitable and tolerant of people of different views from oneself. Do you disapprove of it? Well, again, for the same reason, I am bound to. Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. All others have been thieves and robbers. When I find thieves and robbers being accepted into the church and their views being tolerated and praised, surely I am bound to protest. The point is this, that Christ, we claim, I claim, is unique. You mustn't put anybody near him. You mustn't mention him in the same category as Confucius, Buddha, or Muhammad, or anyone else. Why not? Well, because he's the only begotten son of God. This isn't my theory. This is Christianity. This is what the apostles preached. They preached Jesus and the resurrection. I wish all interviews were that substantive. But that was a demonstration of biblical tolerance of people and intolerance of error. You know, Christian, perhaps you've even heard the phrase, be known what you're for and not what you're against. I can imagine that being a helpful encouragement, you know, from a mature Christian to an immature Christian who is maybe gripped with trying to establish some sort of superiority and put somebody else in their place verbally. And, but in and of itself, it's not a true statement. You should be known for being for what the Bible's for and against what the Bible's against. Imagine being for Christ, but refusing to be against what he's against. Intolerance of error is in the very fabric of the gospel. And yes, it's going to make you a minority. But every saint, from Genesis to Revelation, has lived in a minority. The psalmist, Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. Verse 104, same stanza. He starts with, oh, how I love your law. He ends with, I hate every false way. There's an antithesis in Scripture. You have to be for the truth and be against error. You can't be for the truth without being against the error. And so the question is, are you, if you're going to be faithful to that kind of gospel, you have to be governed by the fear of God. It's the only way to remain intolerant of error. Father, we're so thankful for Paul's example in Galatians, and we just want to come before you this morning and ask for grace because, Lord, we know our hearts are fickle. We, we, we are very thrilled at the prospect of living in such a way to please you, and even this morning, maybe during the sermon, maybe during communion, we have even had to confess, no, no doubt, um, that we can still find ourselves being concerned about what people think of us. So, Lord, deliver us from sinful fear of man because we long to remain faithful to the gospel, to remain loyal to you. Strengthen us so that we might persevere. In your name we pray. Amen.